Tonight we're going to be beginning the first of a, it's kind of a series, we'll call it a series, on the spiritual disciplines. Um, it, it's been a passion project of mine for off and on the last couple of years. Uh, but there, there are things that have kind of fallen out of favor in, in the West. Some of them have, some of them are trying to be revived. Um, but the idea of the spiritual disciplines isn't so much, they're, they're not a, an end to themselves, they're a means to an end. That is, these are the things that Christians practice to get themselves continually in God's path, as it were, to come in contact with His grace and, and His mercies. And so things like daily Bible reading, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, serving, journaling, uh, those types of things. Uh, and so tonight's lesson is really just the beginning of this series to kind of introduce this idea of the need for training ourselves for godliness. And if you want to open your Bibles, as I said just a moment ago, in the letter of 1 Timothy, and the, four, the chapter is 4 and the verse will be 7, or at least around verse 7. Paul says here, but refuse godless myths fit only for old women. On the other hand, train yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily training is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds the promise uh, for the present life and also for the life to come. That phrase there, train yourself for the purpose of godliness. Godliness, sanctification, holiness, those words kind of sometimes are synonyms in the New Testament. But that's what God's will for us here on earth is. Our holiness, our sanctification, our becoming more, taking on the character of God. And by that verse, we see that it's not something that happens passively. There is an active effort that must be exerted on our part to take on godly character. Anyone, any of you who have done any sort of team sports, have done any sort of marathons or so forth, uh, even practice an instrument, you understand this principle that those things do not happen overnight. That it takes intentionality, discipline, and a plan to get to a certain level where you can compete on those things. Um, I did high school water polo. I did taekwondo for several years. I would probably flounder if you threw me in pool today, and <laughs> I, I'm not term, terminate, tournament ready right now when it comes to Taekwondo, because I haven't been practicing. I haven't been training myself in that discipline. So this idea carries through on the spiritual realm as well. And so we need to start off tonight, but just understand that there is a biblical precedent, and there is a need for us to train. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14, after the Hebrew writer kind of getting to the climax of the book here of admonishing his readers to continue in the faith, to continue to be faithful, uh, to not give up on Christ, after chapter 11, which he gives all those great examples of people, everyday people, who live lives of faith, he says here in chapter 12, and the verse is 14, Pursue peace with all men, and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. That's what the Legacy Standard says. Uh, some other Bibles might say holiness or godliness. So that's our goal. There is, a, there is a need to pursue. It needs to be a focus in our lives. And as we read at the beginning in 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 8, it doesn't happen overnight. Timothy was admonished. Train yourself for the purpose of godliness. I mentioned offhand just a few seconds ago, what does training involve? You can't do it haphazardly. You need to have a plan. There needs to be a plan in place. You need to have uh, measurable goals in mind of what does this look like. So on certain things when it comes to the Christian life, it's pretty obvious. Say you, before being a Christian, you had the mouth of a sailor. No disrespect to those who are Navy veterans. But um, perhaps language is not wholesome grace to those who hear you. Well, the goal and the measurement is pretty clear. Clean up the language. Stop using certain words. Stop making certain jokes. You have a measurement there. You have an idea what progress and growth looks like. That's more of the putting off side. 
on the more positive side, such as for the spirit of trying to pursue joy, peace, goodness, faithfulness, well, that's going to be incremental. You know, we, we ended this morning's lesson with some practical things on how do you cultivate joy in your life. Well, that's, that's a lot of sowing that takes place incrementally that in the long term you'll see uh, immense gains in the end. But you have to be committed to the process and the plan. Um, we have to have the right motivation um, when it comes to our discipline for godliness. So uh, Jerry Bridges... He's a denominational author, but he was one of the few guys in the denominational world who actually was writing seriously about like, hey, yeah, we're saved, but you know, we, we still have an obligation to live holy and righteous lives. Now, he's writing from perspective of somebody who believes in one saved, always saved. He's wrestling with that. And it's, it kind of boggles your mind as when he writes and teaches on like the need for sanctification and obedience and like living faithfully, he's good. And then you get to the salvation part, and like, man, how did you get off on that? Anyway, that's this little Brendanism there. But he made this point in several of his books that sometimes the reason why we don't see progress in godliness is because we have the wrong motivation. We have a fear of failure. Or we want to make sure we maintain a good reputation with those in the congregation. Or we, we don't have the true, only right motivation, that is to please God. It doesn't matter what the neighbors think. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. What matters is, am I living in harmony and pleasing to God? So let's take Joseph here, for example, back in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 39, this was referenced a couple times uh, this morning. But in Genesis chapter 39, starting in verse 7, now, to kind of recap biblical history to this point, Joseph has been sold into slavery. He's been elevated to, in the house of Potiphar, he's basically the right-hand man. There is nothing withheld from him except Potiphar's wife. And Potiphar's wife doesn't seem to respect that or care about that, really. Because he wants Joseph. And so we read in verse 7 of chapter 39, and it happened after these events that his master, his master's wife, set her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has given, given all that he owns into my hand. There was no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Now let me tell you what that conversation might have been had Joseph not been a God-fearer. Well, I can't do that. Potiphar will have my head if I do that. I'll get fired. I don't want the neighbors to find out. And let's not undercut that there is a temptation here. Uh, just in verse 6, um, we're told that Joseph was beautiful in form and beautiful in appearance. That's the biblical way of saying that Joseph was a good-looking young man in his prime. He had all the temptations and all the biology and all the hormones of a young man. This is a real temptation. But was it, what was Joseph's overarching goal in his life? He wasn't concerned about offending Potiphar. He wasn't concerned about what the social norms were. His overarching concern was, how could I do this and sin against my God? That was his goal in life, to live in harmony with his maker. Now, if you're living in harmony with your maker, all these other things, those are secondary and tertiary things that come into play, don't get me wrong. But sometimes when it comes to godliness, it's, we, we can have the wrong motivation. I might see sin as simply as a bad habit to kick, and you know, if I fall off the wagon, I fall off the wagon, and I can, let me just restart again. Instead of seeing the sin and ungodliness as an affront to my maker and my heavenly father. The apostle Paul had the same approach. Um, there's many verses we can quote, but if you want to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 24. And there's some principles here too. I wanted to quote this in the last point and this point, so it kind of pulls everything together. 
But there's some principles here, too, about the need for training ourselves for godliness. But Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 9, starting in verse 24, it says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Now everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself would not be disqualified. It's going to come up in just a moment, but you, we can reference Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, that Paul considered his life left on the earth after becoming a Christian as Christ's life. It was no longer his aims, his goals, his wants. It was what Christ wanted, his goals, his aims. God was Paul's overarching goal in life. To be pleasing to him, to be found not having a righteousness of his own, but a righteousness which comes from Christ, and to be in harmony. So when it comes to these spiritual disciplines and training ourselves for godliness, this has to be our motivation. Um, this has to be our overarching goal. Um, nothing else will do, because nothing else will provide the right motivation to actually grow in godliness. Um, so, our goal then is godliness, but really we're talking about a deeper devotion to God. And, and devotion... I think a good way to define it is a life lived for the glory of God. It's not simply something we do in the morning. We do some Bible reading and a prayer, and that's, that's good. That's part of it. But devotion has, carries the idea of like something that is devoted, set apart for a purpose. You know, Paul in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, talks about how we, as our living sacrifice, is devoted to God. Again, Romans chapter 12, looking at the first two verses here. He says, Therefore, I exhort you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, living, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and pleasing and perfect. Let's go back to verse 1. Present your bodies as a sacrifice, living, holy, and pleasing to God, which is our spiritual service of worship. A living sacrifice, a, a life that is devoted for the, to the glory and majesty of God and to show others that glory. And then we go in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Where Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live for Christ. That was his goal. And you can find preachers and Christians throughout centuries who kind of tongue-in-cheek or very seriously made Galatians 2.20 their own goal. Martin Luther, famously, I think it's an apocryphal story. Somebody had knocked on his door and asked his wife, is Martin Luther here? And I guess he had a sense of humor or something, but he yelled out from his study, he says, Martin Luther is dead. It is only Christ who lives here in me. We kind of laugh at that or smirk, but I think it was 100% serious. And I see men like that and people like Paul, and I think I, I still have a lot to go, a lot to learn. But devotion to God or a life devoted to God really requires three essential things. The first is the fear of God. J.I. Packer, in his book, uh, Knowing God, which is bestseller of the last century, several times pointed out that it's something that was lacking in his day, and I would still say is still lacking, is preaching and teaching on the wrath of God, the fear of God, and the holiness of God. Because he, he pointed out, as a, as a Puritan preacher in the 30s and 40s, that there was, no, there was no issue of the problem of evil in Christianity when the wrath and justice of God was preached on. When that got neglected, and God got basically characterized as a Santa Claus figure in the sky, 
who only gives good gifts always, all the time, never punishes anybody. So that's when we start having this question about, okay, why does bad things happen? The ancient Christians never wrestled with that because they knew God was a God of justice and would, bring to rec would recompense every evil deed done in the body. And for the believer, there needs to be a healthy mixture of the fear of judgment and the reverence that we are serving a holy and righteous God. So in Acts chapter 9, in verse uh, 31 here, I find it interesting that you know, Book of Acts records the church when it grew very rapidly. It was in a, under persecution. Um, this is after Saul begins to preach Jesus. He's been converted. And we see in verse 31 of Acts 9, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria was having peace, being built up, and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. It continued to multiply. They had a healthy respect and reverence for who God is, and especially the Jerusalem church. As you just flip back a couple of chapters in your Bible and book of Acts, you have Ananias and Sapphira, two people who did not have the fear of God, and they were struck down because of that, and they're lying to, to God. And so they had real experiential knowledge of what God's holiness was like. And sometimes, I think, I'll speak personally, periods of my life, I look back, and there were, that could be characterized by spiritual apathy, were periods where I did not have a good understanding of the holiness of God. Because one of the things that Paul points out in Romans chapter 3, about how all are condemned under sin, he points out one thing in Romans chapter 3, we're going to look in verse 9 to begin, he has just gotten done with the Gentiles condemned, the Jews condemned. He says in verse 9 of chapter 3, What then? Are we better? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, and he continues to quote several scriptures here, but you look in verse 18, he quotes another. He says, There is no fear of God before their eyes. That is a characteristic that distinguishes between the believer and the non-believer. Do you have the healthy fear of God? And so for the believer, I would say it's more about reverence. There needs to be the, the, the fear there of judgment because our God is a consuming fire. But understand that God means what he says and says what he means. But this fear of God cannot sustain a believer. It's part of a trinity, if you will, of what's necessary for deeper devotion. You might think of fear of God in, on one corner here of a triangle, and on the other corner you have the love of God. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, again, the book is 1 John chapter 4, and we'll be looking at verses 9 and 10. Let's back up to verse 7 for, for context. John writes, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And by this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And we can keep going with what John has to say there. But we need both of these if we're going to have a deeper devotion to God. And we can overdo it on the fear. To where love gets neglected. And you can overdo it on the love where the fear gets neglected. I read a quote recently, and I think it sums up this point pretty well so far. You know, your behavior will show how you view God. If you believe God is nothing but a vengeful, wrathful, Zeus-like figure in the sky waiting to smite you at the first sign of disobedience, you're going to live as an abused child. 
But if you live as if God is only love and will never punish anything and always gives you what you want, you're living like a spoiled child. And we, both, we all know from our earthly parents that it's both. It's both. I can't tell you how many times when we, me and my siblings would complain about our parents being too strict or too harsh, I can still hear, and I'm, I say that, he's still alive, I still get told this, but it says, you're going to be thankful for this one day. Your other friends run around like, the, their, their parents don't care. I was told multiple times that your friend's parents do not care about them, but they let them do whatever they want. And the proof, of, proof is in the pudding. You know, my 10-year class reunion is this year, and I, it's, it's 10 years is long enough to see the trajectory where people in my class went, and some went off a cliff, basically. And those were the kids who had parents who really had no boundaries, no discipline, none of that. And in hindsight, I, I, I love my parents even more for all the rules that they had. I mean, we joked that if you wanted to do anything in the Ashby household, it had to be submitted in triplicate four weeks in advance. So, you know, but there's a balance. There's a balance. And so, like, for example, in our study of Hebrews right now, it's a balance between warning and encouragement. So when we come to the warning passage, we need to camp on the warning passage and be fearful and heed the warning of falling away. But when we come to the encouraging passage, we need to savior and treasure the encouragement. And the third aspect of a deeper devotion is developing a desire for God. A desire for God. You look in Psalm 27. Again, the psalm is going to be Psalm 27. And we're going to be looking at verse 4. David writes, One thing I have asked from Yahweh, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of Yahweh all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of Yahweh, and to inquire in his temple. David's desire was to be near God. David in another psalm says, One day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. And I might ask myself, have I ever felt that way? Have my affections been so trained by God to desire him in that way? And it's perfectly okay to say no at this juncture. This is what this series is designed to help us all do, is to grow in the love, fear, and desire for God. You know, we sing a hymn from time to time based on Psalm uh, 42, the first two verses. Again, Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? The writer continues on, but, you know, we, we sing a hymn called As the Deer Pants for the Water. And it's based on this psalm about this longing and desiring for God in his presence. And this is now coming to mind, but I think a good indication if you have a desire for God is how do you react when you miss your morning devotional or you you can't attend with the saints on a Sunday? Is it a blip on your radar? Do you even notice it? Or is your whole week kind of thrown off? Do you miss being there with the saints? Do you miss time with God? Maybe some would think the way I pray at times is a little disrespectful, but I I feel like I've gotten to a point now in my life where it's this ongoing conversation. And I know if I miss that morning devotional time, it's not going to be a good rest of the day. And those days I tend to lean even harder on prayer because I didn't have the morning feast for the Spirit. It ends up being this ongoing conversation of, like, Lord, help me, 
Lord, I should not have done that. And you just, it becomes this ongoing thing. But it's this desire that you want to be close to the God. It's this ongoing conversation with your maker, knowing that he's actively helping you and trying to, and helping you become more like him. So these three essential elements are what make up a, de- what help us get to a deeper devotion or life dedicated to God. So this is going to be very brief and very overview because we're going to be diving deeper into these next things as we progress through this series. But depending on what you look up online, what books you read, there's either 12, 18, or possibly 20 uh, spiritual disciplines, depending on who you talk to. Um, but a book I read recently called Habits of Grace took a different approach, and I like his approach. He really broke them down into three categories. And that is the hearing God's voice, the having his ear, and belonging to his body. So your engagement with the word, your engagement in prayer, and your engagement in the people of God in worship. And I like this approach a lot better, but sometimes when you read a big book in the spiritual disciplines, you feel like, I can't do all these things. You don't have to. Throughout this series... If something resonates, if something clicks with you, focus on that. The the idea is focus on incremental improvement, not trying to do everything all at once. That that doesn't work. Um, And so with hearing God's voice, that's how we engage with the word. And this would include Bible reading, meditation, memorization. Um, And meditation and memorization, those are two of the areas that by and by and large in the West have kind of fallen out of favor. Um, and I mean intentional memorization for the nourishment of your soul. You know, I, I, there was a story told when I was at lectures about a small little town and they were getting ready to do a, a court proceeding and uh, they couldn't find the Bible to swear anyone in on. And they were looking and they're looking and finally they said, just... Just go get John Smith down the road. He's memorized pretty much the whole Bible. We can put our hands on his head. I want to get to that point, right? I want to get to the point where I can quote the whole book of Philippians if I want to. But there again, that takes intentionality and effort and training to do so, right? Peter says, long for the pure milk of the word in 1 Peter 2, 2 so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. This, this idea that we read earlier in Psalm 42, the, the longing and the desiring for more engagement with the Word of God. One of my favorite charts, one of my favorite illustrations I've ever seen, because it still hits me every time I see it, is it's a line this way, and they have all the books of the Bible listed on the bottom. And then there's all these arcs showing where how these books, how Matthew references back to Genesis and how Isaiah is referenced in, Isaiah, in Revelation. And it just shows the interconnectivity of the scriptures. And you're just like, wow. And I know they probably missed something. And the more you study, the more you study, you find out these echoes and these imageries and these typologies and, and how it's just no human mind could put it together. And there's always something new to be learned. There's always a next level of application. There's always something more. And so that's why Timothy was admonished, or in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, to study the scriptures, but in chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, my memory just blanked, so let's turn there. In 2 Timothy, Chapter 3, looking at verses 16 and 17. That all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be equipped, having been thoroughly equipped for every good work. That training in righteousness. And so there has to be a, a healthy diet of the scriptures. And one of the great things about the day and age we live in, you can choose your medium, you can choose the way you engage with the scripture. There's apps now uh, that you can have 
just verses repeated to you over and over again to aid in memorization. You, there's audio Bibles. There's any different ways to engage with the text so it can be with you always. I think the Apostle Paul would be floored with how much and how many different ways we can engage with the Word of God today, and so often many of us choose not to, when really there is no excuse. Secondly, having God's ear. I like how the author phrased it, because that's what prayer is. It's, we have the ear of God. He, he listens to us. And so we have that model prayer, which was revolutionary when Jesus spoke it. To call God your Father, to have that intimacy, to have that relationship with your Maker. And Paul, in the letter to the Colossians, in chapter 4 and verse 2, He says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well. And he goes on to a prayer request there. But the idea, again, devoting ourselves to prayer. At risk of maybe sound like I'm trying to bind some sort of rigid formalism to it, which I'm not. But we saw in the, we see in the book of Acts that the apostles and many Christians still kept the hours of prayer that they had done all their life from Judaism. Not as a requirement to be saved, but it's a good practice that they continued. Why not pray at 9, noon, and 6 p.m., or whatever it may be? Why not incorporate more prayer into your life? Why not be ready and devoted and ready to do that. One thing I've tried to start, I've been trying to do more of is instead of, when somebody tells me about a, a prayer request or something, instead of saying, I'll pray for you, if they're with me right there, I'll say, let's pray right now. And when some of you have texted me or other people have texted me about a prayer request, what I've done is instead of saying, I'll pray, I pray right then and there, and I text the person, I prayed for you and will continue to do so but like all things that are worth doing it's going to take some intentionality and some effort and we'll have several lessons uh, tied to that on how we can improve and uh, and increase our prayer life this is where the uh, ancient practice of fasting might come into play as well um, to heighten our awareness for the spiritual things that we need to be focusing in on and maybe one little application point out there in fasting, one writer made this point, the time that you would have spent eating that meal that you're giving up, use that time for a spiritual pursuit. Okay, I'm foregoing my 30-minute breakfast this morning. I'm going to spend 30 minutes in prayer and devotion reading. You're giving up something to do something spiritual. And it doesn't necessarily have to be food either. You can fast from all sorts of things, and we, I think we all need to fast from all sorts of things. Uh, and use that time for a better spiritual pursuit. And thirdly, they're belonging to his body. God has ordained the church as a means of, <clears throat> not a means, but an aid to our sanctification. We have spiritual shepherds to watch over us. We have the mutual edification of the brethren. We have the assemblies. And I go back to Acts 9, verse 31. It's, the, it's plural there in that verse. The, the churches in those regions, they were walking in the fear of the Lord and being encouraged in the Holy Spirit. It was a togetherness they were doing this. They were much more involved in each other's lives than perhaps we in the United States are today. It was a very communal culture partly of necessity, but partly just a mindset. And when we neglect the body, we're cutting ourselves off from a whole realm of encouragement and training and edification that God has placed in our lives for a reason. Um, you know? I'm really glad we're part of a local congregation and we can have this. I'm really glad that Brother Rob Kingston words his prayers the way he does. 
I'm really glad that we have the capable song leaders who know how to lead and, and, and do those things. I'm glad we have men who can teach. And it's not like I'm trying to spy on y'all, but when I'm out of town, I do watch the live stream. <laughs> and I receive edification from that. Not all because I'm like on a time delay so I can go attend wherever I'm attending there and watch that. So it's, it's a good thing. But these are the three main areas. And these are not ends themselves, but these are a means to an end. If our end is godliness and our end is pleasing to God, these are the things God has given us to help us in that. And so we'll be beginning next week, Lord willing, with focusing in on hearing God's voice of what can I do on a weekly basis to engage more with the Word of God. And we will progress as the Lord wills through this and this series there. So I appreciate your kind attention tonight. Um, you know, every lesson we preach can't necessarily be on salvation, but we never want to close an hour of worship or study without briefly going over salvation. You know, in the book of Acts, since we quoted there a little bit tonight, in Acts chapter 2, there's a whole bunch of people gathered together on the day of Pentecost. It was a Jewish feast day. And you had a built-in audience. And this is the first time the gospel in its entirety was preached, that Jesus lived, died, and was buried and resurrected. And Peter preaches a sermon there in Acts 2 about why this Jesus is the Lord of the Old Testament on whom we need to call upon to be saved. And he gives three points. One, Jesus was the subject of biblical prophecy. Secondly, he was attested by miracles, signs, and wonders, which no man, other man could do. And thirdly, and the most powerful is, he rose from the dead of his own accord. And so that's why at the end of the sermon he says, this, let all the house of Israel know for certain, this man... God has made Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And so the crowd cries out, verse 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he saw me bore witness and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this crooked generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day they were added about 3,000 souls. That's what a person must do to be saved. That's not something we came up with. That's not a particular doctrine to this congregation. That's what the book says. And we want to stand by what the book says, what God has said. And so if you have need of that tonight, the water, there is water ready. Maybe you need prayers of strength or encouragement like our brother Chris this morning. The invitation stands open. Won't you come as every stand and sing the song that's been selected?